Hello everyone and welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video and you could consider today's episode of Matt Plays Kerbal Space Program a semi-sequel to my SpaceX Starship Munship recreation in that we're going to uh, build a SpaceX Starship. So I guess it's a, it should be a prequel, right? Because I kind of built uh, the Super Heavy and the Mun ship before I built the actual Starship itself. And in the real world, one would assume that SpaceX will build the Starship first. I kind of realized halfway through that video that that, that, that was the order I probably should have done because I had to refuel the Mun ship in low curb in orbit and I didn't have a normal Starship to do that refueling. So I kind of made a very janky not very good looking starship uh, to do that servicing. So now I'm going to make amends and I'm going to build a starship replica. However, I was a little bit anxious about doing this because I'm very aware, and this is the reason why I've not done a starship replica up to this point, I'm very aware that there are literally, and I know this because I've counted it, 10 billion different Starship recreations on YouTube and Reddit and the KSP forums. And I was like, I don't really know what I can bring to the table here because, you know, I, I would be the first to admit that I'm not the best at making complete faithful recreations of real vessels. Um, I, I'm just not, it's not really my forte when it comes to Kerbal Space Program. So I know that despite, even if I put in all my best efforts, I'm not going to make the best looking or most faithful looking starship out there. So what can I do? And I was like, well, maybe we can try and make an actual functional starship in that one that can actually deploy cargo uh, by opening up its nose cone. The real starship, I'll show a little animation by the great Eric X and Small Stars, uh, the nose cone sort of hinges open a bit like the Mark III cargo bay ramp in Kerbal Space Program, but of course the Mark III cargo bay ramp would look awful on a starship recreation. And I could, there's no real way of doing this kind of opening using fairing pieces. So I decided to have the nose uh, open up as a whole, a bit like uh, cargo aircraft do, where the cockpit uh, swings to the side or swings up to allow large payloads to kind of be moved into the fuselage of the aircraft. So that's what I've done there. We've got this alligator hinge that will uh, lift <laughs> the entire top assembly of the nose cone, uh, exposing the cargo bay and allowing us to deploy some cargo. I've got those two pillars made of the small fuel tanks. I believe there's 15 of those small fuel tanks stacked on top of each other uh, to act as structural support. So when the hinge closes, uh, the whole thing remains rigid and it kind of holds the nose cone assembly in place by using some junior docking ports. Uh, the rest of the starship I'm just building out of fairings because that's really the only way you can achieve the silver starship look using stock Kerbal Space Program parts. You may have noticed there is some fuel tank clipping inside the main fuselage of the starship which I know very cardinal sin of Kerbal Space Program is clipping fuel tanks. However, if you were to use the five meter diameter fuel tanks in lieu of a five meter diameter fairing with fuel tanks inside it, uh, the volume of the fuel contained in those five meter tanks would be greater than the amount of fuel in my Starship. So going by the actual volume of the fairing, I've not actually got an excess amount of fuel uh, in this. I've actually got less fuel than would fit inside the space inside the fairing. I hope that makes sense. But as you can see, the main starship itself is pretty much done. We just need to add the fins now. I guess I should say the flaps because they're not like wings, they're flaps. And viewers of Space This Week, which is my Monday show where I talk about space news with particular emphasis, well, a major part of that show focusing on starship development will know that starship doesn't really have wings. It doesn't fly like the space shuttle. It'll belly flop and it falls like a skydiver using these big control surfaces to, um, I, I guess, manipulate its pitch and actually that's it. It manipulates, it manipulates its pitch in order to steer itself toward the landing pad. Now, there are a few ways you can do this in Kerbal Space Program. Um, some initially, I think, one of the most popular ways of doing it was some air brakes sandwiched between some hinges that aren't motorized and the air brakes inside will push and pull the flaps and that's sort of how it's controlled. But I think a lot of people realize that you can actually just achieve that using the braking ground robotic hinges by binding them to the pitch action group. So I'll show you exactly Exactly how to set it up because there is a very specific way you need to configure it but that's what I'm doing here I'm building the flaps themselves using the silver structural panels because I think that's the closest 
uh, where you can achieve the look of the flaps. And uh, then I'm just sort of covering up the hinge pieces with some smaller panels just to mask that ugly grey bare hinge piece. And speaking of ugly, you may have noticed my windows, which look kind of like big goofy buck teeth on the top of the starship. Uh, there isn't really an elegant way of emulating the look of the starship windows in Kerbal Space Program, or at least the artist's impression of the starship windows. I imagine this might not be exactly how it looks when the real vehicle is done, but it's a very difficult shape to achieve in Kerbal Space Program. What a lot of people do is use either lights or flags to kind of have imitation windows. But I wanted my Starship, as I said in my thesis at the beginning, to be a functional vehicle rather than purely as an art piece. So I wanted my windows to be functional. So I thought that the best kind of approximation I could get to having functional windows in the Starship while maintaining the general aesthetic I wanted was to clip some of the Mark II lander cans together as you've seen here. Now for the flap action groups, we're going to set them to pitch and target angle. We're going to whack that input response speed all the way to maximum, and then we're going to click inverted for the bottom fins and set the control to absolute. You know, the three bars that looks a bit like a phone signal gauge? Click that to make it a bit like a barcode, so it's not an incrementally increasing straight line, just a bunch of straight lines that are the same height. I don't know, just watch the footage and make sure your action group settings look the same as mine, and that's that's how you do it. Now comes the part where we sort of have to take some creative liberties here because the real Starship doesn't have its final landing legs yet, it just has the little temporary landing legs, so I've just sort of guessed what the landing legs might look like by just using the biggest landing struts available in stock Kerbal Space Program and making them a little bit prettier by clipping them into some landing gear shrouds, but I've made sure that when you press the landing gear action group, it doesn't deploy the airplane landing gear, it just deploys the landing struts. And they still work despite being clipped into those uh, airplane landing gears. On the subject of action groups, I'm also going to set action group 1 to fire up the central 3 raptor engines, action group 2 to toggle their gimbals, so they're not just gimbling when we're in space and don't need them, and action group 3 will be to fire the three vacuum raptors, which are being represented by the wolfhound engines. I've also locked the gimbal of the wolfhound engines to zero, because the real vacuum raptors I don't believe have any gimbal uh, capabilities, because they're just too big to move around inside the starship skirt. What other action groups have I set up? I believe I set up action group 9 would be to activate and deactivate the motors of the starship flaps, because we don't need them for the main ascent. And I've also bound action group 0 to set the control point to the internal docking port inside the main car go bay, because by default the game will want to control from those upside down command pods, which won't do. Anyway, speaking of cargo, I want my starship to have a proper cargo, not a boring ore container or fuel tank, so I thought about it for a bit, and I thought, what about a small monolithic space station? And given the commercial nature of the actual real starship, let's make it the world's first ever private commercial space station. But what sort of client would even commission a private space station, I hear you ask? Why, none other than Curiosity Stream, who have also sponsored today's video. Curiosity Stream boasts a plethora of streamable documentaries and non-fiction TV shows that span a huge range of topics, from history and nature to science and technology. Curiosity Stream has a massive range of award-winning exclusives and original shows, and is available on a huge number of platforms, meaning you can stream their content to any device or viewing at any time, anywhere. Just use the code MATLOWN, all one word, or simply click the link in the description to get 25% off and pay just $15 for an entire year. And with a massive library and 35 collections of curated programs handpicked by CuriosityStream's experts, that's an insanely good price. I've been a huge fan of CuriosityStream for a long time now, and I cannot recommend them enough. For just $1.25 per month, this is the best value streaming service money can get, and hey, by signing up, you'll help fund Kerbal Space Program's first ever commercial space station. Every subscription made means another orbit for our crew. Anyway, the crew is all on board the Starship. We are ready to launch, so let's not delay the flight any further. Let's, let's get airborne. That was a very long explanation for me saying let's launch, and now we're in the air, and 
the thrust weight ratio is not great upon initial takeoff, so we're holding a, a vertical orientation uh, for the initial part of the ascent whilst we pick up, you know, some reasonable semblance of speed, and then we can gradually begin our gravity turn. I guess the ascent was slow for me, but through the power of video editing, I can speed up the footage to make it a little bit more tolerable for you guys. Anyway, for the uninitiated, you may be wondering, wait a second, when did you build that super heavy? recreation there, Matt. And, uh, I, I just used the same Super Heavy booster from my Starship Munship video, so if you want to watch the construction of the Super Heavy and maybe the rest of my Munship recreation, which I was very proud of, uh, you can click the card on screen, or I'll put a link in the description if I remember. Uh, so you can watch that video. I think if you click the card on screen, it opens up in a new tab, so you won't lose your progress in this video. Uh, anyway, we're on the subject of this video, uh, I'm going to detach the Super Heavy booster when we've got about 900 meters per second of Delta V remaining. The reason for this is because I initially planned for it to be a thousand meters of Delta V remaining when we detached, but when I landed the Super Heavy the first time I did this, uh, I had 300 meters per second of Delta V remaining, so I thought, well, we could probably get a bit more uh, ascension out of the Super Heavy. Something just exploded on it then, I'm not sure what. I think I ignited our Raptor engines a little bit too soon on our Starship, which is now in full flight. Yes, the Laun Aerospace Starship SN1 is our first orbital test campaign with crew with cargo, commercial cargo at that. So uh, step up your game, Elon. What is all this? Faffing around with hops and all that. Just go straight to orbit. It's easy, trust me. This is exactly the same as real life. In fact, one limitation that we have against real life is that we can't control the Super Heavy and the Starship at the same time. Yes, you may have noticed I made a quick save just before decoupling the Super Heavy, and that's because, unfortunately, this particular Starship recreation, you can't do a proper flight profile in stock Kerbal Space Program. You either have to land the Super Heavy and you lose the Starship, or you get the Starship in orbit but lose the Super Heavy. Uh, so I've got to make a quick save. Once we get into orbit, we'll reload the quick save and land the Super Heavy to show you that it can in fact land itself. And then we'll have to reload the quick save where we got the Starship to orbit, I'm afraid. That's just a compromise of this vessel. Maybe I'll try and improve upon it in a future iteration. But for now, this is the best I got. Uh, anyway, I have now switched from our... Uh, sea level raptors to our vacuum raptors. I had to use the sea level raptors initially because we were still fairly low down in the atmosphere. The vacuum raptors wouldn't have provided the uh, thrust that we required to get ourselves into orbit. We wouldn't have reached uh, an adequate velocity before passing our apogee and falling back down to Kerbin. Uh, so once I kind of, once your apoapsis starts getting nice and safe and high and far away from you, like the time to apoapsis is not too low, and you're fairly high up in the atmosphere, you can just switch to the Wolfhound engines. I can't remember exactly what altitude I switched. I didn't have an altitude in mind when I did it. I was just sort of looking at kind of the various Kerbal Engineer readouts, my fuel gauges, and the maneuver node thing showed me where my apoapsis was and how far away I was from it, and just sort of made a guess. So if you want to if you're, not, if you're struggling, just look at when I did it. I, I don't remember, and I'm not going to pause the commentary. What is this? A quality YouTube channel supported by generous members? Well, I can confirm it's the latter, definitely. Uh, the loud... <laughs> that was terrible. Don't really know where I was going with that. I was just sort of trying to awkwardly segue to saying, I've got channel memberships now, which now seems really tacky. Uh, now I think about it, but you can join, you get a little badge next to your name, there's probably people commenting below with a little, uh, that could be green badge at this point because the program's only been out for a short while, so uh, people won't have the longer member badges yet, but you can see them in the comments, you can join by clicking the join button under the video, great time to be had by all, you get videos a little bit earlier when I can, when, when I can offer that, and you get a few perks like community only posts, and uh, and you get emojis, that's it, you get custom emojis in comments and stuff, so that's all, it's all fun. Anyway, you may have noticed whilst I was waffling on just then and, uh, you know, selling out that uh, I've switched back to the landing phase of the Super Heavy Booster. Now, I will admit that my, uh, my Super Heavy, it's not, it's not really as realistic looking as my Starship. Uh, we don't actually have a Super Heavy yet. Uh, to reference as of me recording this video. We had the BN1, I guess, but, you know, BN2, BN2.1, BN3, they still haven't really been put together, so we don't know exactly what the Super Heavy is going to be looking like as of me recording this, which actually, um, by the time this goes out, there might well be a Super Heavy. So who knows? SpaceX are building it quite quickly. Anyway, I'm landing here, and you might have noticed that our fuel is uh, running out, but... We actually have a lot more Delta V than the Delta V readout is indicating because can you see that sort of white band? 
above the landing gear. That's a fuel tank that's full of fuel, and it's disabled. Uh, my, my, my original plan with the Starship Munship vehicle, which is a heavier vehicle than my Starship apparently, uh, was that that fuel tank would remain locked and be full of fuel, and then when you do the super heavy landing, you just enable that fuel tank to get a bit more delta V, and also it makes sure that that fuel tank isn't used at any point before the landing, so there's more weight concentrated at the bottom of the super heavy, uh, therefore making it easier to land. So I guess I could have decoupled the super heavy much, much later on in this flight. So whoops, if you do this mission yourself, I downloaded the craft in the description, you could probably get a little more mileage out of uh, what I got out of it, but I mean, all I wanted to do was deploy this beautiful commercial space station on behalf of Curiosity Stream to low carbon orbit. So I think, for all intents and purposes, it's fine. We could just say that's a ballast tank just to help keep the Starship on track. I am sure SpaceX plan on stuffing a layer of concrete in the bottom of the super heavy booster. That would make sense, right? To keep it on track. So let's just say that in that. Uh, very weirdly specific reality. That was a recreation of that. Let's go with that. Anyway, we're going to put some Kerbals on the space station. Uh, you probably figured out that the uh, hatches on those uh, command pods are going to be obstructed and Kerbals won't be able to exit. The eagle-eyed among you may have noticed that in the build, I did in fact initially put a Mark 1, is it called the Mark 1 lander can? You know, the little one-seater lander can. I clipped that into the fairing piece and just had the door exposed. But no matter how, like, little I occluded the door from the fairing, it would always say, cannot transfer hatch obstruct, or cannot EVA hatch obstructed. And I couldn't elegantly get it to work properly. So instead, I used the inflatable airlock, which can, if you expand it, can serve as a hatch for Kerbal. So if you want to add a hatch to a vessel that doesn't have any accessible ports, you can use the inflatable airlock from the, I think it came with the Making History DLC, I'm not sure if it's in the base game. And there is the space station doing a quick test deployment of all the gear, making sure it all works and Curiosity Stream can perform science for the people, for the betterment of mankind. Or Kerbal kind, I guess, in this reality. And now this isn't the orbit they wanted to be in, actually. They wanted their periapsis to be at this height, but they wanted their apoapsis slightly higher. So let's just fire up those engines there that will not only allow us to put the space station into Curiosity Stream's desired orbit, but they can also serve as reboost engines. So if the space station's orbit decays, those engines can be used to boost it up. We don't need to dock a space shuttle with the station or anything like that. Obviously, moot point in Kerbal Space Program because orbits don't decay. But if this was a real thing, and you know the Starship is going to be a real thing, I guess it is in a way. <laughs> it already is a real thing. Uh, if this was a real thing, then it would be useful to have those rocket engines on the space station. And now we must commence what I would consider to be the most difficult part of this mission, and that is landing the Starship. And I kind of made it difficult for myself, not only because I wanted to, you know, land it properly without the use of parachutes or any easy mode solutions, but I also wanted to land it at the launch pad of the Kerbal Space Center. I didn't want to land it on the launch pad actually because I value my sanity first of all and also because there's still some launch clamps that I didn't recover on the launch pad and I wanted an excuse in case I missed. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we're just going to land it next to the launch pad, but I'm going to try and get as close to the launch pad as I possibly can. Uh, and it's difficult, you know, I'm used to gliding stuff back to Kerbal Space Burger. I mean, SSTOs, space planes, space shuttles, I can do it with my eyes closed, with gliding back to... nearly. I could do it very easily in Kerbal Space Program. But belly flopping, a giant grain silo, which doesn't have wings, but just structural panels that started glitching out a little bit as we uh, re-entered the atmosphere and they got exposed to a lot of aerodynamic pressure. Uh, it, was, it was not as easy. And we can't just, you know, glide and land like an airplane. We have to fire up the Raptor engines, do a flip maneuver, and land ourselves vertically. And I've got to manage the deployment of the landing legs as well. So it's overall a lot more difficult than landing a more conventional Kerbal Space Program space plane. Or I guess just any plane in general. Starship is a lot more complicated to land. As SpaceX has uh, very kindly demonstrated for us in real life with Starship's SN8 through 11. Although, I don't know, has SN15 reflown yet? It might have reflown by the time this video goes out and it might not have landed successfully. But maybe it did. I, I don't know. I haven't got a... I am not... I have not got a crystal ball in front of me, unfortunately. Uh, I don't know what I was talking about there, really. <laughs> 
I did notice just then, actually, I decided, let's see what the crew can see right now. And I pressed, you know, the I pressed C on the keyboard, which lets you see what the crew can see. And it turns out my dreams of having functional windows on this starship were somewhat dashed. Because while aesthetically it looks nice and they light up when you turn on the lights and stuff, uh, the crew can't actually see out. It turns out that all they can see is fairings. So that's presumably why they're... Uh, their portraits at the bottom right of the screen look a little bit messed up. I guess the game doesn't really know how to render them because there's a fairing going through their heads, which is kind of morbid when you think about it. Anyway, can you see those uh, structural panels are starting to separate a little bit there? And physics time warp isn't enabled, so I'm not quite sure why they started freaking out a little bit. But nonetheless, they served their purpose. I forgot to disable them, actually, uh, for our landing bird. The landing bird was very stressful. I forgot to disable the uh, pitch control of the flaps, but we should have disabled them if we wanted to be completely realistic. And I'd say... I don't know. I'd say that's pretty darn close to the landing pad, to the landing, to the, to the launch pad, to the launch pad. English, can I speak it? I cannot. Uh, I did want to land on the actual, because see how the grass texture changes when you get to the launch pad. So I don't want to land there, because I know that that grass is not completely flat. And I didn't want to go to all that effort and get into that close proximity to the launch pad, only to then tip over because I landed on uneven ground. But there we are. We have landed, and we didn't tip over. We landed fairly hard, but nothing exploded. Um, and there it is. We do a little bow with the starship deploy the payload bay. And salute my patrons who are scrolling past on screen. Thank you, each and every one of you, for kindly supporting this channel. If you want to join their magnificent ranks, you can click the little Patreon link on screen. Uh, there's videos also visible as well from my channel. Check out my Munship video if you haven't seen that one. That was kind of the prequel to this. And you can join the Lounge Squad using the join button below the video. Oh, I've run out of time.